You are listening to Harvest Bible Chapel KL. For more information, please visit our website at www.harvestkl.org. I invite you to turn or grab your Bibles and turn in them. Now wait for it. You haven't been here in a long time, I promise. The book of Nahum, chapter 1. Now, Nahum is a minor prophet, and so you'll need to turn in your Bibles. If you have a book Bible, those of you cheating with phones, you can just look for the N-A-H, Nahum signal. Those of you looking in your actual Bible books, you'll need to turn to Psalms, roughly, that's about halfway through your Bible. Turn right, and you'll get to some of the, what we call the major prophets, and then the minor prophets. That's not because they're insignificant. Uh, it, they are just as significant as the major prophets, but oftentimes because they're shorter. And then Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum is where you'll be. Uh, I know that uh, sometimes it's hard to get to some of the le- le- uh, places that we read less in the Word of God, but I want you to turn to Nahum chapter 1 because in it contains a verse that has been most impactful in my life. Now, oftentimes we talk about, you hear me say, this is my favorite book, this is my favorite book of the Bible, this is my favorite verse of the Bible, and you know it changes all the time, and the whole thing is my favorite, and I can't just pick one favorite, but when I say it's the most impactful, I mean it's a verse that has for many, many years ministered to my heart. It actually started in 1993 when I was 16 years old, and my parents informed us that we would be moving. I had lived in Indonesia for 15 years. I called it my home. It was the place I wanted to live the rest of my life. And my dad said, nope, we're moving to Chicago, Illinois. I said, Chicago, what? And why would we move there? That doesn't seem like it make any sense. And so in my teenage heart, as I tried to figure out which end was up, uh, I came to a spot where I realized that this was God's working. And this was the verse that was used to get me there. Actually, my, I'm grateful for, for, for an earthly father who directed me to the scripture and a heavenly father who made sure it was in the Bible for us even here today. My dad created a plan for us as we made this transition, and in the months leading up to it, we had each day of the week, we had something different to pray for, and as we looked with expectation towards it, we got to pray for some some things that were kind of broad, but some things that were specific as well, and so uh, I began to pray for, get this, I, I prayed for a fireplace, because I knew Chicago was cold, and I was going to hate cold. I still hate cold, and so I was praying for a fireplace where we could burn fire, burn wood, some sort of place to live that had a fireplace, and the Lord answered that prayer, by the way. We had a fireplace and used it regularly all the time. But oftentimes, we would pull out this chart that my dad had made, and it was something that every major move that I've made in my lifetime since, I've done the very similar thing. And this is a chart from actually 2003 uh, when I moved, when my wife and I moved. Actually, at that point, only Josiah was born. And on this, you'll see different days we prayed for different things. And, uh, and in that, notice at the very top, the verse that my father commended to our family. It was Nahum 1.7. And I memorized it in the New International Version, so I memorized it to say like it is up there. The Lord is good, a refuge in times of trouble. He cares for those who trust in Him. Isn't that a great verse? That's a fantastic verse. And in this... I want to continue our series using this verse. Our series has been called Learning to Live by Faith. And I would suggest today that to live by faith, I must learn that God is good. We've been doing this series and we've been talking about different skills that we need to have faith. We've been talking about where faith comes from. We've been talking about the fact that faith requires us to wait many times. It requires us to listen and obey to God's word. We've seen examples of great faith where authority, uh, where uh, the centurion placed himself under Christ's authority, where we see the widow is persistent and humble. We've seen how God cares in the storm. We've seen how, didn't you like my friend last week? We survived the zombie apocalypse. Like, who, what, what, who comes up with that? Well, somebody like Ian, and you got to meet him next week, or last week, and Ephesians chapter 2, faith that brings us salvation. But in this, I would suggest that unless you believe that God is good, all of these other things that I've taught you won't make sense. I would say it this way. If you don't believe God is good, you won't be able to live by faith. 
This is a foundational bedrock, like put the big stone in the jar first type of thing. This is the thing that all the other things that we've talked about in faith is required that we understand and know and learn. And so even this year in 2018, as our church is asked the Lord, Lord, would you build in us a strong faith? And as we've done a series central to that whole thing where we're learning to live by faith, we need to recognize that a lack of faith is an incredibly serious thing. I'm sorry, Hebrews 11, chapter 6 says, without faith, you know the verse, without faith what? It's impossible to please God. Matthew chapter 13, verse 58 tells that when Jesus was walking on earth and he was doing many mighty miracles all over the place, that he came to his hometown and he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief or lack of faith. James chapter 1, verses 6 and 7 tells us that when we're in trouble, we should come and we should ask God in prayer and we should pray in faith because if you don't pray in faith, you're like somebody who's tossed around by the waves back and forth, back and forth. You doubt and you don't receive because you don't pray in faith. Lack of faith is a serious thing. We won't experience victory over sin. We won't find comfort during times of heartache. We're going to have needs that we're going to do everything we possibly can do. I'm going to work, 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 but we never actually ask God to intervene in any way. Ultimately, lack of faith is a serious thing because it is the difference between heaven and hell. Eternity with God and eternity without God. And so it is a significant thing. Lack of faith is serious, and we're learning that we must live by faith. The many times that the scripture quotes this tells us that this command is something that's very important, and we're trying to learn, okay, if I'm commanded to do it, then how do I do it? And today, we need to learn that God is good. Something that's simple to talk about, maybe a little difficult to interact with, and certainly difficult when things are troubling us. So today, we're learning some things about faith, it's going to require some humility and teachability out of you. Everybody say, I don't know it all. Say, I don't know everything about faith. Say, I want to learn about faith. See, that fires up your pastor. Like, you're done. Lunch isn't happening until about four o'clock this afternoon now. So, kidding, kidding. That won't happen. Here's, let's learn some things. Number one, learn this. Learn that God is good. I'm going to spend most of the message on this right here. We have two more points, and we'll do them quickly at the end, but we got to do this first. Learn that God is good. Write that down in your sermon notes. You'll see some in the bulletin there. Learn that God is good. It'll help you remember if you write it down. Learn that God is good. Nahum 1.7 says, the Lord is good. Amen? Amen? The Lord is good. It's interesting how he describes himself here. Really, he begins to describe his character. And something that you might miss when you read this is that you might miss what the word Lord actually means in this particular verse. I've talked a little bit about this before, but I want to really make sure you understand this today, that when you're reading the Word of God in the English language, you can read the word Lord, and if it's capital L-O-R-D, we recognize that that's our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that's that we're talking about our God, Right? But if you, talk, if you read in your Bible and all the letters of the word Lord are capitalized, that means something else. Look, look in your Bible right now. Are all the letters of Lord capitalized? Yes. Jesus is trying to convey something really important for us about himself by using this particular name. Now, name is something that's important to us. Everybody has a name. Uh, everybody, we understand when I use the word Chand, Chand, sorry, you're sitting up front today. Thanks for drumming for us, by the way. When I use the word Chand, if you know Chand, you know who he is. All I have to say is Chand, our drummer, and you have a picture in your mind of what he looks like, and if you've interacted with him at all, you know that he's a gentle but strong spirit. And you begin to understand his passion for the word and how he does that. And in that, if we use the name, it's a descriptor of their personhood, right? If I were to say Simon... If I were to say Richard, if I were to say Ben, if I were to say your name, you would know it, that who I was talking about because of personhood. And in this, we understand that a person is kind of identified. They have different ways of going about things. It's one of those hard lessons of getting married, right? 
She doesn't do it the same way I do it. She doesn't see it the same way I see it. She doesn't feel about it the same way I feel about it. And because we all have different personhoods, there's just different things about who we are. Every person has their way. And I want you to know when God says the Lord is good, he's telling us that this is his name and this is his way. Hosea 14 verse 9 says, The ways of the Lord are right, and the upright walk in them, but transgressors stumble in them. Hosea is telling us the ways of the Lord are right. He has ways. He has ways of going about and doing things, and they're right. Uh, Isaiah 55 is a helpful companion to this because in in verses 8 and 9 it says that His ways are beyond our ways. And so sometimes it's hard to understand God. I, I wouldn't do it that way. Why are you doing it that way? And in it, we're finding that God has a personality. He has a character. His characteristics have a, have a way, and they're right, and they're good, and sometimes it's hard to understand them. The Lord has ways. Not always easy to understand, but trusting His ways is good and right because He's good and right. And so we've been developing a definition about what it means to trust the Lord, and we've been building this definition over time. What is faith? And and we've come up with a couple different things. Faith is trusting, it's leaning on, it's resting in and believing in the promises of Jesus because He's good. We've talked about how faith is total dependence upon God that becomes supernatural in its working in us. It's an active trust based on evidence, but But if I were to have you write down a definition today, it's up on the screen, I would have you write this down. Faith is acting with full trust while I wait for God to do what He has said, whether I feel like it or not. Because He is good. That's the thing we're adding today. Because He is good and 100% faithful. We've been talking about this, how we're, we're gonna, faith is this fully trusting thing. It's this waiting thing. It's this listening for God. It's, it's not my emotions. It's something that I receive with my mind and then act upon allowing my emotions to follow because he's faithful. He always keeps his promises. And today we're adding this bedrock foundational stone. He's good. He's good. He's good. That's why we can trust him. Because if we don't believe God is good, we won't live by faith. We won't trust His promises. We won't combat our feelings. We won't wait for God at all. But if He is good, if He is good, it changes the whole way that we live. So many of us struggle with this idea that God is good. And because of it, we, you know what? I'm going to date him or her no matter what. I'm going to get my money however I can, whatever I can. It doesn't matter how I do. I'm going to use people for my purposes. That's that's when we don't trust we do those things. And in it, we have a constant battle that says, I'm going to do it myself, right? How many here struggle with the I'm going to do it myself way of thinking? Everybody raise their hand. We all do, right? I'm going to do it. I have ways And why would I let somebody else's ways influence my ways, even if it's God and even, I don't know if he's good because sometimes he takes me through some really hard things and and sometimes he allows some difficult things and right now it's really, really hard to trust them. And so I'm going to do it my way is what we oftentimes find ourselves in. The problem is we will damage ourselves if we believe a good thing must be gotten because God is not good and he won't give it to me. God, God, you, you want me to have this. You, you created family. You want me to have a spouse. And I'm tired of waiting for you, so I'm just going to do it my own way. I'm not going to trust you in this matter. We oftentimes stumble there, stumble there, but God is good. And that changes all of those situations that we might be facing. Let's define good for a moment. Good means kind, generous, benevolent. found this interesting. It means to bless children. And when we see it, in the, see it in the Word of God, many times it has that context of we want to bless somebody, and so we want to help them, and we want to heal them, and we want to hear them, and they're significant, and we're for them. And I believe that trust happens when we begin to believe and understand that God is for me. 
That's what we find all throughout the pages of Scripture. If we just do a quick study, just to remind you that in Genesis chapter 1, God created everything, and it was what? It was good, 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 and then what? Very good, right? That's the creation account. And then we see in Psalm 136 that it's a good thing to praise the Lord. So what we were just doing for the last few moments, like that's a good thing. That's, that's really good. Mark 10.13 says that only God is good though. And then we come to a rather significant verse in the Bible, Romans 8.28. That for those who love God, He works all things together for their good. That's kind of an important verse to have. Actually, I would suggest that's a really important verse to have. To understand That God is working all things together for your good. He's for you. He's for your good and your best. And so all the things that are going on in your life, everything, even the, I have to say it, even the painful and the hurtful and the things that have seemed to injure me, the things that are out of balance and they're not yet the way that God would even describe it as good, like he's working all of those things together for your good. So many times we're selfish about this, but yeah, I began to think about it a little bit further and say, is it good even if I make some mistakes that are against God's goodness? And the answer is he's working those things together for his good. That's kind of shocking when you see that he begins to piece together even the things I've had to repent of. He's working those things together for my good. Mind exploding thought there. So many times we're selfish about it. We think, how could God work well all the things that they've done to me for my good? Why don't you turn that around and think for a second, all the things you've done against him, he's even working those things, all things, all things are working together for your good. That's what the verse says. And so what we find here is that the unshakable bedrock of the Christian faith is this idea that God is good. He's for me. Now, It's not enough just to see that on the pages of Scripture and to know it in my head. What I found is that I must experience this as well. If I'm really going to trust God in that full, wholehearted, do whatever He says, no matter what I feel type of way, I have to have, listen, trust just doesn't happen overnight, does it? It's something where lots of little things add up to the fact that I can trust you. And so our experience with God is really important in this. And actually, uh, we need to actually try and experience it. It's kind of like um, if I were to say to you, um, does anybody know what like, one of my favorite fruits in the world is? It's the king of fruits. I thought about bringing one today, but I knew it might clear the church out. So, but, but here's the thing. Um, I've tried to help my children understand, kids, durian is awesome. It really is. You laugh like you don't think it's true, but trust me, it is. It's the king of fruits. Don't you hear what the title is? Okay, king of fruits. Great, great fruit. Daniel So and I, we love to, we've experienced some durian together, right? And so I've tried to convince my children this, and um, and my children don't believe me. I don't know why. I can't figure it out yet. And so one of the things I've, but but here's the thing. One of my children. They, they've done something, they've heard that this king of fruits is an amazing fruit, and so they've tried it with me. And uh, one of my other children have not. They haven't tried it. They haven't known whether or not durian is good or not. They've, they've made some assumptions about it, and they say it's bad, I can't figure out why, even though it's the king of fruits and it's the best fruit ever, right? Right? And so that's an important concept to think about when when we come to the realization of what Psalms 34, verse 8 says. It says, taste and see that the Lord is good. And some of you are like one of my children who are like, taste and see? No way. I'm not tasting and seeing if the Lord is good. I just don't believe it. Some of you are holding back in your faith and you're maintaining control of your life and you're saying, I'm going to call the shots. I don't put my trust in anybody. I remember when I was in 
school and we had to drink a glass of milk every morning and we, were, we had this horrendous, terrible powdered milk that they would mix with water. So it was like water milk and it would come and there would be like chunks in it. And the way that I would drink my milk is I would hold my nose and I would drink the whole thing as fast as I could because you can't taste it if you hold your nose, right? And that's not what this verse is saying. This verse is saying, let all of your senses come to an understanding, taste, and see that the Lord is gold. Don't hold your nose at this. Don't make an assumption before you've actually tried it. Taste and see that the Lord is good. And some of you are like, man, that's just so hard to believe that I could give up control and authority to somebody else, even God. And if we had a real conversation, you would never say in church, but if we had a real conversation over a cup of coffee, you would be saying, man, I I just don't like his commandments. I don't like the things he tells me not to do. I want to do them. And the verse is saying, no, taste and see that God's ways, they're, they're the best. They're the best. We need to come to the realization that all that God commands is for our blessing and that all that he condemns is for our protection. And if you taste and see you'll know God loves you. And he's not trying to lessen your happiness in life and make things difficult. He's trying to give you the best if you would but taste and see this to be true. So it's not enough to know it, not enough to see that I can trust him because he's for me, but we also need to trust him from experience. Take little steps of faith so you can take the big steps of faith that are coming that you're going to need to take down the road. Because God wants to bless you and he loves you and he's leading you into his righteousness for his name's sake. All of those things are scripturally true. So then what we come to realize is that the goodness of God is the soil that faith grows in. That that if we plant a little seed of faith, if I put my faith in God, and it's just a little seed of faith at some point, if I put the seed of faith into the soil of God's goodness, that's going to motivate me when I see there's nothing else to go on. The truth that God is good is going to help me when I'm like, how could this possibly work out for my good? How could this possibly be good for anything? I don't know if I can trust God anymore. When you're in that dark, deep moment and you need to trust God, His goodness, the reminder of His goodness is going to be the thing that allows faith to sprout in your heart. It's this idea that there are better days ahead. That while my prayer hasn't been answered yet, it will be answered. That while God promises something different and it's hard right now, it will be different. It's not going to end like this because God is good. He's at work in my life. He's at work in my family. He's at work in my workplace, bringing all of those things together for his good. And if you're not living by faith, you're not standing on this rock, you won't live by faith. So we have to learn something. We have to learn how to live by faith. We have to learn God's goodness. What does God's goodness really mean? How does it impact how I live? Well, learning means I admit that I'm not an expert right now, and you all just did that earlier. Thank you. We're not an expert in this yet. This is a lifelong thing that we continue to learn. And as we start trusting God at a new level, and as we start realizing that He's good and He's for us, that means I'm going to have to stop doing some bad habit types of things, some faithless things that I would suggest is pretty regular in our lives. Let me suggest three of them. When it's hardest to live by faith, I need to stop, number one, stop reaching and striving to fix it myself. That's a faithless act. That's one that says, I'm got it. it's all on me. It's all me. I have to get it done. I'm going to get it done. And listen, willpower has accomplished some amazing things in this world. But mostly for evil, when you think about it. And we need to learn how to stop striving to fix it ourselves. Now, faith, I believe, is an active thing. We've even talked about this a little bit, that, that it is something that we actively are engaged in whatever it is. So if I have a broken relationship with a significant family member, I don't just sit back and wait for God to work. It's, no, I'm doing godly things. I'm, I'm forgiving them. I'm loving them unconditionally. I'm serving. I'm, I'm doing the things that God has called me to, but I have to realize that when I've done all that he's called me to, I need to, Psalm 46.10, it's up on the screen, be still. 
and know that I am God. That's a really hard command. I'm just going to tell you that. As somebody who loves to fix things and to do things, and like when something's going wrong, I'd like to jump in and figure it out. And some of you are here, that's your ways too, right? Some of you are like, I don't like to do that. That's not your ways. Others are like, man, I love to fix things. I love to get it, get it accomplished. I love to accomplish the achievement of fixing it. We need to hear, be still. And know that I'm God. My ways are higher than your ways. They're right and they're good. And after you've done godly things, you wait for him. And don't overstep into things that are faithless. Because God wants to teach you how he moves when we stop trying to fix it. Some things only happen when God works. And sometimes we just have to trust that. Here's the, sec- here's the second thing. We need to, when it's hardest to trust God, we need to stop reviewing in our mind all the options. Now, I'm not a person prone to worry, but I know that some are. I know that, know that some, for some of you, you're like, I'm not a fix-it person, but man, I worry about things. Like if worry could be work, I would be an awesome, awesome worker because I worry so much. And this going over in our mind, looking for a signal that God is good over and over. God, are you in this? Is this for you? Is this what you're doing? Is this the right way? And I'm so anxious and I'm so worried and you need to stop. God is good. Faith is not a sight thing. It's a hear thing. You need to listen to the Word of God that says He's working all things together for your good. And you don't have to worry any longer about that thing. We need to stop reviewing in our mind. Here's the third thing. Uh, Just entertain your pastor a little bit with how I describe this. We need to stop writing the vuvuzela of right now. You're like, vuvu, what? Vuvu. It's like those plastic trumpets that came out of the 2010 World Cup, right? That's what a vuvuzela is, but no, I, yesterday I was at Sunway Lagoon and I, read the, I rode the vuvuzela water ride. This thing is awesome. Have any of you been on this thing before? I mean, this thing, like, it's the greatest thing. Like, you start out and you're just kind of like this lazy river and you're, there's like six of you in a big tube and everything's going really well until you hit the 30 meter drop off <laughs> and your stomach's up there and you're down here. But then, it doesn't stop there. Notice here, it's a big bowl. It's a huge bowl. And so then you go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And it's an awesome water ride. And it's a terrible way to live life. (laughs) Stop riding the vuvuzela of right now. I see a positive sign. I can trust God. Oh, no. It doesn't look like I can trust him anymore. Oh, I can trust him now. Oh, no. I can't do it anymore. You get what I'm at now, right? The vuvuzela of right now. It seems like I can trust him in my marriage in this moment because things are getting better, and then, man, it just doesn't seem like I can do it anymore. It seems like my child who's far from God is starting to come back, and I can trust him now, and then it doesn't look like it anymore. It seems like my career is going in a great direction. I'm going to get a promotion and all is going to go well and then it falls through. It seems like I'm in good health and then the doctor said. And I would just tell you that it sickens your soul to go back and forth about God's goodness in those moments. We need to stop questioning his goodness, because that's not living by faith. Psalm 27, verse 13 says, I would have despised, it's up on the screen, I would have despised unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Yes, wait for the Lord. This is a verse that somebody needs today. I would have despaired. I'm, in, I'm almost there. I just don't think he's going to work. I don't know if it's going to happen. But listen, you can believe in the goodness of the Lord. That's what it's saying. Even in your darkest moment, in the moment where you're like, I just don't think he cares anymore, you can say, God is good. And I can believe 
I'm going to see the Lord in the land. Like right now, I'm not talking when we get to heaven, it's all going to get better. Like right here on earth, it's going to come to a place where God's goodness overwhelms how bad things are going, and I'm going to see it. I'm, he's here. He's solved it. It's not the way it was. But right now, it doesn't feel that way. I want to be careful as I preach this message to you today. I want to be careful that my intensity of belief about God being good and and my conviction that the Word of God is 100% true about being good, that it doesn't bruise you in the midst of whatever you're walking through right now. Some of you are sitting in the chair right now and you're like, God's good. This is awesome. I love this message. And others of you are like, I can't believe he's talking about this. Because man, it feels so far away from it. I don't want to indicate to you that you should always know and experience every moment that you're, that, that you're going to have this. That there won't be moments of darkness and, and doubt and struggle in these things. Because the reality is, it's not true that you're always going to be 100% believing that God is good. There's going to be times where you're like, ah, I don't know. It's scary. And the issue there, according to this verse, is that it's time. God is good, and you don't always see it, but you will see in the land of the living God's goodness, and you don't have to despair. We're learning that God is good, and that we can trust Him in completeness because of it. He he showed it to us in His Word. He shows it to us in experience, and if you would take but a few little steps today to stop reviewing and to stop going back and forth about God's goodness and just begin to take a little step forward. He's good. He's good. You'll learn God's goodness. Now, there's a second part of this verse that kind of goes together with this first. The Lord is good, right? I I learned it in my version a refuge in times of trouble. Look, we use the ESV here in Harvest KL. It is a great version. It says, a stronghold in the day of trouble. Same thing is being communicated. The Lord's a refuge. And that's why, secondly, write this down in your notes. Don't just learn that God is good. Run to Him in times of trouble. Run to Him, towards Him, in times of trouble. Many times, trouble comes and we run every which way but towards God. And what this verse is saying is, he's a stronghold, that's a good thing, that's where the protection is run to him. He's a stronghold in the day of trouble. Stronghold is interesting. It's, it's not like some places in Scripture where a stronghold is a stubborn pattern that has to be destroyed. Sometimes that's how God word, God's Word uses this idea of stronghold. 2 Corinthians 10 is really what I'm thinking there. But, but that's not what it is. Rather, a stronghold here is a safe place provided by God. Now, if you look at Nahum chapter 1, you see that there's actually a number of things that are going on, and, and the context here is really going to help us understand more about what it means to be a stronghold for the Lord, or what the stronghold that God has provided for us. So what we see here is that these verses, this, this book is actually written to the, the country of Judah. Remember how when Israel was divided, there was a northern kingdom? called Israel, and a southern kingdom called Judah. And what had happened was the northern kingdom, uh, a couple of hundred years before this book was written, had been taken out of the land by the country of Assyria. And that was God's punishment to them. And so they had been taken into captivity into Assyria, and into the capital of Syria was Nineveh. Now, something significant happened while the nation of Israel was in captivity. God sent a prophet He was an evangelist, and while he did an awesome job, because people getting saved is what God does, not what men do, he was really reluctant and had to be swallowed by a fish and then spit out, right? Jonah went to Nineveh, and he walked from one side of the city to the other telling people about God, and he did it in the worst attitude possible. Think about your teenage child stomping away from you. That's how he did it, and hundreds of thousands of people came to Christ in Nineveh. Now, that was about 150 years before this all happened. And what had happened since that time was the people of Nineveh had returned to their old ways. 
and, and they were known as the most brutal empire in the world. They're still kind of known that way. If you go read the history books, they were terrible, terrible people to the people that they captive. And in it, Judah was feeling the pressure of Nineveh now coming to get them. Now, that didn't happen because God said it wouldn't. That's right, chapter 1, Nahum. That's where he says it. And the message is, God says, listen, I'm going to pour my wrath out onto the city because God does that for real. Believe it or not, he has some really strong feelings about rampant wickedness and unrepentance. And so really, it's a warning to even to us today. Like if, if, if we're just involved in wickedness and we have no repentance in this, like th- these words are kind of how, listen, God will give you grace if you ask for it. He'll give you grace. You're, it's never too late. You can't go too far beyond God. But listen, if you never give in to God's grace, his wrath is poured out and this is what it looks like. An article concerning Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum. Nahum chapter 1, verse 1. Here's chapter 2, or verse 2. The Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on his adversaries and keeps wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power, and the Lord will by no means clear the guilty. His way is a whirlwind and a storm, and the clouds are of dust of his feet. He rebukes the sea and makes it dry. He dries up all the rivers. Bashan and Carmel wither. Those are mountains. The bloom of Lebanon withers. The mountains quake before him. The hills melt. The earth heaves before him. The world and all who dwell in it. Who can stand before his indignation? Who can endure the heat of his anger? His wrath is poured out like fire and the rocks are broken into pieces by him. Nahum is the most depressing book of the Bible you'll read. Because there's only one verse that gives hope in it. And it's the next verse. Nahum 1.7. See, verses 2 to 6, it says that God is a jealous and avenging God, and he's going to take care of the judgment that is righteously his to give out. But what about your people, God? Are you concerned for them? Have you ever felt that? Have you ever felt like God is distant and not really concerned for you? Or that in the midst of all his judgment, he's kind of overlooked your attempts at faith and belief in him. And you're like, man, God, do you, like, I'm not like them, but it seems like I'm getting everything they're getting, sometimes even worse. God, do you care? Are you there? Are you concerned? How long, God, is this going to go on? And that's why this verse is here, because he's good. And he's a stronghold in the day of trouble. And you should run to him when it feels like you you most are out of control. You should run to him when it seems like it's most coming down on top of you. You should run to him. And he's going to be a place of protection and help. Why? Because God is... He's good. He's good. His ways are always right. Right. He's working all things out for your good. His are the best. So we run to Him. There's one last phrase that's said here. He knows those who take refuge in Him. I wrote it this way. Please Him. Please God, because He knows when you're living by faith. He knows those who take refuge in Him. He knows those who are trusting Him. I mean, this is an amazing thing. This is like when, you're, when your kid is on the football pitch and he just did a great little move and he looks up into the stand to see if you saw what just happened, right? This is like the gymnast who puts in hours and hours of time and the coach is shouting on the sideline, well done! This is like the artist who overhears her parents whispering to her friends, did you see how good their artwork is? Right? When we know When we know that God sees our faith, it motivates us to act in more faith. And what this verse is saying here is God knows everything. You say, of course He knows everything. He's omniscient. We've been through that that passage before. But that's not what it's saying in this verse. It's not saying that He knows all the things that are going on. He's saying that He knows you personally. And He knows when you personally are trusting Him and having faith in Him. He sees that, and like the kid on the football pitch, he looks and sees if the parent is watching. He sees it is the affirmation of this verse. He knows those who take refuge in him. I think this is such a motivation to know that God knows what's happening in my life and knows when I'm trusting him makes me want to trust him more. 
And instead of reaching to fix things and reviewing all the things in my mind and writing all the doubts out on the vuvuzela of now, I'm resting in Him and I'm waiting for Him. I'm listening to Him and He sees it and knows it and He is pleased. It's the opposite of Hebrews 11.6. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. What does that mean? It means with faith... It's possible to please God. You are pleasing God. As you live by faith, you're pleasing God. I mean, I think this puts everything else that we've talked about into context. I mean, to live by faith, I have to learn at the bottom that God is good. He's for me. He wants the best for me. His ways are right. I don't always understand Him. I have to trust Him in it. But when I'm trusting Him, He sees it and it causes me to want to trust Him some more. And in that, it helps us understand all we've said before in our series. Let me just quickly review where we've been. We said that we're going to live by faith. It means we're going to have to learn to wait. Habakkuk said, if it's slow for it, wait. The righteous shall live by faith. We saw in the book of Numbers the story of the exodus of the Israelite nation as they came out of Egypt, and we learned that we have to listen when God says, I'm going to give you this land. And then they say, let's send spies, and the spies make everybody fearful instead of faith-filled. That was a problem, and they disobeyed because they listened to man, not God. Learning to listen to God because He's good is learning to live by faith. In Hebrews 10, we saw that the skills for a reward that God gives and the avoidance of a wasted life that God judges is that we get near, draw near to Him. That means we get right with Him. That we hold fast to His promises and that we stir one another up to love and good deeds. These are the skills that do this. And if you believe God's good, you're like, let's get to it. And if you're like, man, I don't know if God's really good, you're like, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do it my own way. We saw then great faith and how when we place ourselves under the authority of Jesus and we humbly persist when we're waiting and listening, right? You can keep persisting for a very long time if you believe He's good and He's for you and He's working all things out for your good. Confidence in the care of Jesus. We saw the storm in Mark chapter 4 and Pastor Jerry helped us see how important it is to recognize He cares. He cares about every detail. He has it all under control. He's not just some God out there spinning things around. He's personally involved in each of our lives. And then last week in Ephesians 2, 1 to 10, it's faith that brings us into salvation. It's a gift from God so that we would complete all that God has given us in the church, in the world. Listen, if you don't believe that God is good, You won't trust them the way you should. But if you can get this, God's good. Run to Him. He's watching and He knows. And you can be motivated by that. We can live lives of faith that please Him and are for our best. That's the goal of learning to live by faith. (laughs) 